uh, my talk uh, on prosopography uh, is a report on a joint of the joint project which I have with Pavel Ludwig and Rob Nosum from Christiansen and it was proceeded thanks to the support from Novary Grants. Uh, we have perhaps more pedestrian reasons to use prosopographical research than Dagmar presented from her project yesterday. On the contrary, uh, to Dagmar, our group consists of just slightly over 20 people. Hence, it is possible and even desirable to study meticulously all of their life stories. And the point is that due to the scarce sources we have, it is very difficult to construct a reliable picture for any of the single person. Uh, <coughs> therefore, we utilize the fact that the people were in the same situation, or at least very similar, and construct a picture from the fragments of the respective biographies we have. Uh, we simply deduce from one life story to to the others. Uh, let me first explain how the situation looked like in which the German-speaking mathematicians in Prague found themselves in 1938. It was crucially uh, it, it was crucially determined by the specific Prague milieu formed by mixing the Slavic, Czech, Slovak, Polish, Ukrainian, German and Jewish influences. Uh, the community was rather small, nevertheless it was internationally open, uh, accepted and uh, its informal leaders, Georg Pick and Ludwig Berbach, uh, Berbach gradually took the lead during the 1920s. They were both Jewish and both were killed in the Holocaust. Their international renown and their national and religious tolerance were the main pulling factors for the other younger and mainly Jewish scholars. Uh, moreover, in the 1930s, uh, Prague, with its two German universities and uh, liberal political system in Czechoslovakia, became an easy exit civil refuge for uh, the first emigres from Germany. Hence, in 1938, the majority of German mathematical community was formed by so-called non-Aryans, according to the Nazi vocabulary, or by the political opponents of the, of the Nazi regime. The situation of the community uh, drastically and suddenly changed in September 1938, after a so-called Munich dictate, what is euphemistically called agreement, according to which the Czechoslovak border regions populated by German minority were ceded to the Nazi Germany. This caused thorough changes also in the political system in the inner Czechoslovakia. And other, under palpable influence of the German Reich, the German universities expelled their Jewish staff, either released from service or pension. Uh, and uh, it happened in December 38, and uh, a little bit later, on account of a presidential decree, the Jews were released from the state service as a whole. Uh, this all happened even before the German occupation or Nazi occupation of the so-called rest Czechai, rest Czechoslovakia in the March 39. So within within four months, 18 mathematicians felt no prospect for a future existence in Prague and considered emigration. Uh, this is a huge number. These figures are comparable, for example, to centers like Frankfurt, Breslau, or Königsberg in Germany. However, there is a strong difference. Interesting. Uh, Prague people were much less successful in their efforts to emigrate from, from their old university in contrast to 90% successful emigres from Göttingen or Berlin to 60-70% successful emigres from Vienna, they were successful life 
some in, in some 30 percent, like one in three were successful in immigrating. Uh, there are many reasons for this. Uh, the two most important are that they were trying to get into the new system already filled by the previous waves of immigration, uh, and uh, they were also under extreme time pressure. Uh, due to lucky coincidences, uh, the first line of them, Rudolf Carnap, Erwin Findlay Freundlich and Philip Frank emigrated even before the Munich, the Munich betrayal, the, the Munich dictate. Uh, Karnap and, and Frank were in the US for, for, for a longer pe period, for a longer space, and did not return to Prague. And uh, Freundlich uh, immigrated to Britain uh, quite early. Uh, from the other five, I have four pictures. Uh, Arthur Erdneri, this is, this is the man on the right hand side. Uh, flew to Edinburgh in December 38 due to very close collaborative contacts with Edmund Whittaker. Uh, uh, this is Lau Polak who emigrated to Dublin. Uh, in, in the spring of 1938, and Arthur Wittenitz, I don't have a picture, uh, emigrated to Oxford thanks to a lucky co coincidence that, that his father, Moritz Wittenitz, was a famous professor in Indology, and Arthur was born during his, stay, his father's stay in Oxford. So he was a British citizen, and it was easy for him to, to travel to, to Britain. Uh, Karl Leubner and his student Lippmann Bers emigrated much, much uh, later in, in autumn 1939 under very uh, dangerous uh, coincidences. They, they, flew, uh, they flew or drive through the German Reich to uh, uh, and then travel to, to the US. So, what are the factors which determine the success in? emigrating or re-establishing the, the respective scholars. It was claimed that the scientific excellence was the, the only or the main point of the aid organizations who helped the refugees. Uh, however, the situation is much more complicated. It was uh, very complicated and uh, if it, it was important if you were a refugee and want to find a job that your field of study also belonged to a research agenda of a British professor or American professor if you wanted to go to America, and that you had a good personal contacts to, to such a person. This is an example of uh, what happened in Erdely's case. Uh, next, the, uh, the uh, affected scientists reacted on the new situation with widely different degrees of urgency. A realistic appreciation of the impending danger saved life uh, for Enlix or Erlelis. Uh, on the other hand, I was very much surprised by the apparent hesitation in the face of imminent danger. I will speak about it later. And we also confirmed that uh, uh, <coughs> both in Britain and in the US, uh, political refugees were preferred before the racial Jewish refugees who were considered to be just economic refugees. I would demonstrate this on three particular life stories, and uh, the rest of the talk would be uh, well very very sad, and all of the all of the stories are very moving, so it's not probably suitable for fragile souls. Uh, so let's start from. For example, from the uh, from the oh, from the right hand side, this is Heinrich Leivig, who wanted to join his relatives, who were fresh immigrants to Great Britain. Uh, Leivig worked in functional analysis, and despite some contacts and support from John von Neumann, Stone, and also Friedrich Ries, uh, asked. British Society for the Protection of Science and Learning to find him a job. However, as no one was in Great Britain was really interested in, interested in his work, was not prepared to, to offer him a job, 
Uh, he got stuck in, in Prague, luckily survived the Second World War. And then after the war, he was playing much better with the US context and succeeded in immigration to, to Australia, to Tasmania. Uh, second one is Ludwig Berwald, the man on the left-hand side. Uh, in June 1939, so with German troops literally breathing down his neck, Berwald wrote to Whitehead that he is not applying for, for a job and that he wants to wait how the situation with his pension evolves. Whitehead remarked that Berwald probably does not quite realize the terrible time he is having. Uh, however, in another letter addressed to Ian Arnold Schouten, dated in Christmas 1940, uh, he explains that, uh, that he's quite happy, he does care just about his work, about his library, and about his piano. He reports to be proud that he finished three or four manuscripts within last half a year, and that more are coming, and then there is a very quick change in just nine months later, uh, in October, in the evening before the deportation to the Litzmannstadt ghetto, he wrote to Schouten a letter to say goodbye, and the letter begins like, my dear colleague, uh, my existence is to be destroyed soon. So uh, this, this letter was one of the most moving pieces of stuff I've ever read. And the third man in the middle is uh, Walter Fröhlich, uh, who applied for a job in Britain in February 39, got a grant from the SPSL in June, got a visa in July. However, he did not manage to leave Prague before the outbreak of the war. You see how, how tight the, the time was. And uh, on the 1st September, when the, break, the war outbreak, the Home Office cancelled his visa together with all visas of persons still in the enemy territory because Prague was already occupied by, by Germans. It was part of the German Reich as a protectorat, protectorate of the Bohemia and Moravia. And uh, uh, hence also the SPSL cancelled the, the grant because they thought that it was very unlikely that, that Ferry would reach Great Britain during, during the war. And this proved to be true. Fröhlich, same as Berwald, was transported to, 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 to Lichmannstadt, where he died in 1942. Uh, so, and the, the, the decimation and liquidation of the, of the German mat mathematical community in Prague continued after the Second World War, when in May 1945, in the waves of revenge, the German-speaking professors in Prague were, were imprisoned and in the internment camps under the, uh, well, uh, under the bad conditions on diseases uh, died uh, Gerhard Gensen, Josef Furich and Theodor Wallen. Uh, even the German-speaking survivors of the Nazi camp like Heinrich Löwig, I spoke about him, were regarded as suspicious. Uh, the state administration behaved to them with arrogance and overlooking. They have not paid, paid him a, their pensions, so they were also forced to leave the country. And this brought back Prague back in the rank of provincial non-international city. So, um, and my last remark is about a Czech version of MacTutor or Czech cross-topographical project inspired by MacTutor, uh, which is led by Pavel Šišma. However, it's, uh, the difference is that he tries to map all the Czech mathematicians, all the mathematicians working on, working on the, on the, in the Czech Republic. Uh, however, uh, the project is not trying, uh, uh, there, there, it would need much, much more work to, to be complete. Thank you very much.
that yeah. go along. Yeah. Uh, there remain some three or four young private docents and uh, uh, they needed to, to rebuild the, the, uh, the teaching of mathematics just from the scratch. And they named, there, there are new professors named to the positions. Sometimes that it were professors which had experience with situation in Czechoslovakia or in, in former Czechoslovakia like Jehak Kowalewski. He, he worked in, in Prague in 1915 to 1920, then went to Leipzig, and uh, then it's known here that there are some problems, and he was named again professor in Prague in 1940. So uh, the, 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 the university ran rather normally or in some, in some uh, well, minimal way up to 1945. And then uh, after the war, uh, there was a Banach decree, uh, which de which uh, under which the, uni the German universi universities in Prague, the German university in Prague, and the German technical university in Prague were, were cancelled, with the retrospective power to 17th November 1939, like a symbolically, yeah. because well, this is the date when Nazis closed the Czech universities, so really. Way for revenge. Yeah. And then, do you aim for an offline or online publication of the proceedings of the project? Well, uh, well, this this is just a small project, and we plan uh, one publication and two or three talks at the conferences. However, uh, the the complete prosopography is uh, is not online. Okay, so, so you're not planning to put it online? You just uh, well. Uh, we we just worked on we just based the prosopography on this website and uh, we we communicated with, with the author if he would like to add our work into his database and well it's not clear now if it happens or not. Uh, you said the German universities were closed. They closed, disappeared completely, or they moved. The uh, yeah, they were cancelled. The German in 1945, mm -hmm. the universities were cancelled. Uh, the the buildings, the libraries uh, stood where they were, and the people were removed from their positions. Well, uh, uh, some of the German professors ran from Prague to the west before the Russian army. And some of them who did not think get uh, ahead, they stayed. They, who, who stayed in Prague, they were imprisoned. So and then, uh, men, well, practically all of them must go. Were expelled from Czechoslovakia. And then what happened to buildings? And the well, uh, well, in, okay, uh, the the buildings were. Transformed to the Czech parts of the university. It, it's well. It's like it's like right. Yeah, it's like rising the waves of revenge. Well, in, in the beginning, there was just a single Charles University in Prague, yeah. and in the 1880s, it was uh, it was split into two parts, but still two parts of one university: Czech part and German part. And then in 1920, uh, uh, in the new Czechoslovak Republic. Uh, they were formed two, two separate universities, but they say, okay, this is the German university, but the Czech one is the old one, which has all the heritage of the Charles University in Prague from the 14th century. Okay. And, well, yeah. And then the, when the Nazis closed the Czech one, they, they, they did the same as the Czechs. And, yeah. and then, then the next way, I don't know. Well, it's so it's fun. Any more? Yes. Just one very quick remark. Yeah. Finley Freundlich, whom you mentioned, was professor here in the department yeah. of astronomy. Yeah. Yeah. You probably know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thank you for the remark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, and all of our